Our class this week is looking at apostolic succession and it'll focus also on the Petrine office, that is the papacy. So we'll look in class specifically at the topic of apostolic succession in general. Uh, this video I want to look a little bit more specifically at the office of, of the Pope, of, of the papacy. And I had you watch uh, a different kind of video. Uh, if, you, if you haven't watched it yet, it's Steve Ray. Um, and it's from a more apologetic standpoint. I wanted you to watch that specifically for his, his treatment of Scripture, um, particularly his focus on Matthew 16, which is one of the uh, key texts when it comes to the office of the Pope. In this video, I want to do something a little different and look at some of the key magisterial documents having to do with the papacy. And so that's going to turn us to Vatican I, to its document Pastor Aeternus. Again, that'd be 1870. And then also the Second Vatican Council, uh, the document on the Church, Lumen Gentium. So these are the two key magisterial documents that, uh, that deal with the papacy. If you look at, for instance, the Catechism of the Catholic Church uh, on the nature of the office of the Pope, it really refers back to and even just quotes these two documents. So we're really turning to the, to the main sources here. So let's look a little bit at uh, the First Vatican Council, uh, Pastor Eternus, or the Eternal Shepherd. Um, and so almost everything here in the slides is direct quote from this document. Uh, so it begins, the Eternal Shepherd, obviously Christ, the Eternal Shepherd and Guardian of our souls, in order to render permanent the saving work of redemption, determined to build a church in which, as in the house of the living God, all the faithful should be linked by the bond of one faith and charity. So just a few points uh, as, this, as this document starts out. Uh, notice it, it points us to the purpose of the church or the purpose of Christ building a church. It was in order to render permanent the saving work of redemption. So the idea here is that it's the church that carries on Christ's work, his salvific work of redemption. Not only does it hand on that saving message, which was the main topic uh, of our course in fundamental theology, the transmission of revelation. So not only does the church hand on uh, that divine revelation, but also the church is perpetually the instrument of that salvation through the sacraments. Um, so the, the, the purpose here of the church is to make Christ's work of redemption permanent from generation to generation. And so in order to do that, our eternal shepherd Christ determined to build a church. And then notice um, what's linked to that is that all of the faithful should be linked by the bond of one faith and charity. So there's an element of unity when it comes to the church. So the church carries on Christ's work for redemption and the church is an instrument of unity in faith and in love. Then it goes on, uh, well, how does this happen? It says, so then, just as he, Christ, sent the apostles whom he chose out of the world, even as he had been sent by the Father, in like manner it was his will that in his church there should be shepherds and teachers until the end of time. Now, the way this is phrased, the, the chain that's being constructed here, uh, you, you don't see it quite in order, but you'll see that you have this th these links in a chain in which stands first that Christ is sent by the Father, right? And as Christ was sent by the Father, the next link is that Christ sent the apostles. Just as Christ was sent by the, the Father, now Christ sends the apostles. We have this mission of sending going on. That's the very meaning of the word uh, apostle, one who is sent. But then we get this third link in the chain. As Christ was sent by the Father and the apostles were sent by Christ, then there are these shepherds and teachers sent further, right? Uh, further links in the chain uh, within the church until the end of time. This, this is, as we'll see, the idea of apostolic succession, that there is a direct succession. There are these direct links in the chain from the apostles through these shepherds and teachers we know as bishops. So this is send, setting forth this idea of apostolic succession and linking it to Christ 
and the apostles. And then it points to how uh, there is a, a visible sign of unity amongst or uh, amidst that apostolic succession. So it says, in order then that the Episcopal office should be one and undivided. So just pause there for a second. That's saying, okay, so we have this apostolic succession among these shepherds and teachers we know as bishops, but uh, there's many of them. How do we find the source of unity in that Episcopal office um, that is all of the bishops? So in order then that the Episcopal office, the bishops, should be one and undivided, and that by the union of the clergy, the whole multitude of believers should be held together in the unity of faith and communion. So now this is pointing to unity of the bishops, and by means of that, unity of all the faithful. Well, how does that happen? It says, he, Christ, set blessed Peter over the rest of the apostles and instituted in him the permanent principle of both unities, that is, of the clergy, and of the faithful, and their visible foundation. So we have in the person of Peter, amidst the apostles, a source of unity, a visible source of unity. Uh, and the idea here is that that's a permanent principle of unity, that Christ didn't simply set Peter over the, the apostles as a point of unity for that unity to disintegrate in the next generation, but that that, um, that office of Peter remains a principle of unity within the church amidst the Episcopal office, but then also uh, amidst all of the faithful. So Vatican I, what it goes on to do then is in three chapters, expounds the doctrine of the uh, the papacy or the office of Peter in, uh, in three points. First, the institution of that office. Uh, then second, its permanence throughout the generations. And then third, the nature of that office. Uh, and it calls it the uh, Office of uh, Sacred and Apostolic Primacy. It is the primacy of, of the Pope. Uh, now, there is a, a fourth chapter that we're not dealing with here, and that goes into the definition of uh, papal infallibility. But we will cover that in our next class, which uh, our final class has to do with the Magisterium, the Teaching Office, uh, infallibility, and our assent to that. So we're going to look at these three notions of the institution of the Petrine Office, or the papacy, its permanence, and what kind of office it is. So we'll start with the institution, and the Council, the First Vatican Council, says that we teach and declare that according to the gospel evidence, a primacy of jurisdiction over the whole Church of God was immediately and directly promised to the blessed Apostle Peter and conferred on him by Christ the Lord. So it's rooting the office of Peter and his primacy in scripture, in, in gospel evidence, and it points specifically to two scriptures that we'll look at in particular. Matthew 16, that's the, the, the gospel passage of, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And then John 21, which talks about, uh, it's Christ after the resurrection, giving Peter charge to feed the lambs and tend the sheep, that Christ, the one shepherd, makes Peter the shepherd of the church. Now, there's, there's definitely, we'll have to talk about this, there's development that goes on in this. It wouldn't be that if we had asked Peter in the year 60 AD, do you have primacy of jurisdiction over the whole church, right? Did Christ promise you that? He probably wouldn't have known what that question meant. The idea here is that in seed form, uh, we have that in these gospel passages, but the church's consciousness of that, as we talked about in the development of doctrine, had to grow as, as time went on. Uh, but the point being here, the idea of papal primacy is not something invented in 1870. It's not something invented in the Middle Ages. It's rooted uh, and it finds its foundation in the scriptures. Again, now it goes from uh, the institution to the permanence. Um, so the idea here is, sure, Peter um, had a unique role of primacy among the apostles, and most of our Protestant brothers and sisters would admit that. But is that an office that continues? Is there a permanence of that primacy uh, in the office of Peter? Um, and so Vatican I says, that which our Lord Jesus, the prince of shepherds and great shepherd of the sheep, right? that which our Lord Jesus Christ established in the blessed apostle Peter for the continual salvation and permanent benefit of the church must of necessity remain forever by Christ's authority in the church, which 
founded as it is upon a rock will stand firm until the end of time. So the idea here is, of course, if Christ established a church that would last until the end of time, and if in the first generation there was a source of unity in faith and a source of unity uh, in the saving doctrine, then of course that that source of unity would continue, that we wouldn't have a source of unity only in the first generation, only to disintegrate. So the idea, almost from uh, common sense, is that point of unity has to continue into the further generations. It goes on about this permanence. Peter, prince and head of the apostles, the pillar of faith and the foundation of the Catholic Church, received the keys of the kingdom from our Lord Jesus Christ. That's Matthew 16, uh, the savior and redeemer of the human race. And that, to this day and forever, he lives and presides and exercises judgment in his successors, the bishop of the Holy Roman See, that is Rome, the Bishop of Rome, which he, Peter, founded and consecrated with his blood. So the idea here is, uh, it's, it's a bit of a personification of the office of Peter, that Peter still speaks through his successor. And you actually see this in church history, uh, when at, uh, at the Ecumenical Council of, uh, off the top of my head, I think it's Chalcedon, where, uh, the fathers of Chalcedon say, Leo has spoken, sorry, Peter has spoken through Leo. That was the Pope at the time. Um, the idea that uh, Peter's office didn't end with the person of Peter, but continues in the Bishop of Rome, because Rome is where, uh, that's the sea or the, the, the place that Peter consecrated by his martyrdom. Again, going on with this permanence of uh, the office. Therefore, whoever succeeds to the chair of Peter obtains by the institution of Christ himself the primacy of Peter over the whole church, right? So the idea is, again, this is rooted not in historical accident or happenstance uh, or by invention of the church, but the idea of this permanent institution uh, of uh, the successors of Peter was rooted in Christ's uh, will. goes on, so what the truth has ordained stands firm, and blessed Peter preserves in the rock-like strength he was granted and does not abandon that guidance of the church which which he once received. Uh, once again, the gift given to Peter was not a gift for himself personally. It was not a gift for the uh, first generation of believers, but was a gift to the church, uh, this rock-like foundation and firmness given to the church in the office of Peter. And now we can turn, so we've seen the institution uh, of the office, is rooted in Christ's will. Its permanence is rooted in Christ's will. And now we can talk about the nature of this office. And it talks about the power and character of the primacy. Well, what, what kind of primacy is it? Is it just a, a, a primacy of, of a first among equals? Is it a, a primacy of honor? And well, it says no, there's much more to it than that. So Vatican I says that the apostolic see, that is Rome, uh, the, 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 the Roman bishop, um, the pope, uh, the Apostolic See and the Roman Pontiff hold a worldwide primacy, right? So the primacy extends over the whole church worldwide. Uh, and that the Roman Pontiff is the successor of Blessed Peter, the Prince of the Apostles, true vicar of Christ, that is, one who stands in the place of Christ when Christ is physically absent, head of the whole church and father and teacher of all Christian people. So there's a universality of this primacy. It's over the entire church worldwide goes on, the Roman church possesses a uh, preeminence of ordinary power. Um, ordinary power means it can be exercised uh, at any time. It's the, the Holy Father isn't stepping over his bounds or doing something extraordinary uh, when he needs to intervene in another diocese or another see. So the Roman church possesses a preeminence of ordinary power in matters concerning faith and morals, but also in those which regard the discipline and government of the church throughout the world. So uh, it's not simply a teaching authority, but a, a, an authority of governing as well. This power of the Supreme Pontiff by no means detracts from that ordinary and immediate power of Episcopal jurisdiction by which bishops, who have succeeded to the place of the apostles by appointment of the Holy Spirit, tend and govern individually the particular flocks which have been assigned to them. So this is saying uh, simply because the, the Holy Father has... Uh, ordinary and immediate jurisdiction anywhere in the world, that doesn't derogate or take away from an individual bishop's um, authority in his own diocese to teach and, ha and his immediate and ordinary uh, Episcopal jurisdiction, the fact that he's in charge of his diocese. So the idea is 
uh, and this is fleshed out much more in Vatican II, that these two offices uh, work in harmony. Well, uh, Vatican I talked a lot, as you can see, about the office of, of the papacy. It goes on after this to talk about uh, papal infallibility. And Vatican II echoes this. Uh, it says, in particular, it wants to echo the teaching of Vatican I. Um, but it speaks a lot more of, uh, of the bishops, too, uh, in Vatican II. It's uh, the, the role of the bishop, uh, the individual bishops in their diocese, is emphasized more, much more in Vatican II. But there's still a discussion of, um, uh, of the office of the pope. So we can turn now to Vatican II, almost 100 years later, 1964. Lumen Gentium is the document on, um, on the church uh, from Vatican II. So we pick this up in paragraph 22, which says, just as in the gospel, the Lord so disposing or willing, uh, St. Peter and the other apostles constitute one apostolic college, right? So notice the emphasis, uh, uh, first of all, on uh, St. Peter and the other apostles forming this one college. So there's a, a unity uh, stressed here amongst not just the office of Peter, but the office of all of the bishops. So as St. Peter and the apostles formed a college, goes on, so in a similar way, the Roman pontiff, the Pope, the successor of Peter, and the bishops, the successors of the apostles, are joined together. So it's drawing this analogy um, between uh, a Peter placed over the college of, or, or group of the apostles and today the, the bishop of Rome, the Pope, in communion with and over having primacy over the body or college of bishops. It goes on, but the college or body of bishops has no authority unless it's understood together with the Roman pontiff, the successor of Peter, as its head. Uh, it's, it's almost using uh, this language of, of head and body like, um, um, like St. Paul does of Christ as the head of the church. Uh, it's perhaps by analogy here. But the idea is the college of bishops has no authority separated from that primacy which was given to the office of Peter alone. The Pope's power of primacy over all, both pastors and faithful, remains whole and intact. Uh, that is in light of the, the, the College of Bishops. It's not um, that the bishops are over and against the Pope or vice versa. But again, there's this notion of a college, of a body, of a harmony. In virtue of his office, office that is the Pope, um, that is as Vicar of Christ and pastor of the whole church, the Roman Pontiff has full, supreme, and universal power over the Church. That's really just echoing Vatican I, that the Holy Father really does have this immediate jurisdiction, um, not only over his own diocese, but over the whole Church. And he's always free to exercise this power. Uh, it goes on, For our Lord placed Simon alone as the rock and the bearer of the keys of the church, that's Matthew 16, and made him shepherd of the whole flock, that's uh, John 21, so that the um, the reference to Vatican I here is, is very strong. Uh, it's evident, however, that the power of binding and loosing, which was given to Peter, was granted also to the College of Apostles joined with their head. And you find that, by the way, in uh, Matthew 18, that just as Peter was given the power to bind and loose in Matthew 16, so the other apostles were given that in Matthew 18. So again, there's this balance struck between uh, the office of Peter and the office uh, of the College of, uh, of Bishops. But again, there's this reference to unity, but notice in this paragraph, um, there's going to be reference to the Holy Father, the Pope, as a source of unity for the whole church, but then each bishop uh, is a source of unity for their individual diocese. So it says, the Roman pontiff, as the successor of Peter, is the perpetual and visible principle and foundation of unity of both bishops and of the faithful. That's almost a direct quote from Vatican I. The individual bishops, and, and by the way, this is the, the added part, the individual bishops, however, are the visible principle and foundation of unity in their particular churches. So, for instance, here in the Archdiocese of Milwaukee, uh, our visible principle and foundation of unity is Archbishop Listecki. Um, fashioned after the model of the universal church and from which churches come into being the one and only Catholic church. That is uh, the, the unity uh, surrounding uh, the unity of faithful in communion with their bishop, who is in communion with the Bishop of Rome. That union of churches is uh, brings into being the one and only Catholic church. So for this reason, the individual bishops represent each his own church, uh, but all of them together and with the Pope represents the entire church in the bond of peace, love, and unity. So notice the, um, the emphasis both in Vatican I and Vatican II on a visible source of unity. Um, that uh, what is it 
uh, that ultimately keeps us um, in the knowledge that we're united in the same faith uh, that was taught by the apostles and points uh, in Vatican I and Vatican II, particularly to the office of Peter, uh, and in Vatican II also highlights the individual uh, bishops in their own diocese as this source uh, of unity. So when we come to class, we'll look more specifically at the biblical and early church roots of this notion of unity found in this apostolic succession.